And so we want to really give you the answers to the questions you're looking for. Um, so with that, Amanda, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, hey guys, welcome to the the last section of readiness. We are almost there. So we're going to... Um, we're wrapping it up today with, like Meredith said, what to do when you get an offer. Um, today's today's section is going to be a lot of information. Um, so I really want you guys to kind of take it in. Um, if you want to take notes, go ahead. Um, I highly encourage it. But also know that this session is being recorded. So you can always replay the sections that you need to kind of get brushed up on um, or, you know, just need an, another repeat of it. So really don't stress too much about it if I move too quickly for you. Um we created this section particularly for students that are graduating um, soon, um, are about to enter the workforce. This is information that I wish I knew when I was graduating college, um, information that, you know, students have told us that they wish they knew going into college, uh, going into the workforce. Um, so, so it, it is going to be a lot of information, I'm not going to lie. So let's get straight into it. Like we do every section of readiness, we have to do a safety moment or a value moment um, because it is, it is Halliburton protocol. So I thought today we could do a value moment of just staying active, which is so important to do so in 2021. We've been quarantined for a year. We've just started getting vaccines. Um, but we're still trying to stay home as much as possible. So if you're trying to stay active in quarantine, there are lots of things that you can do. You can follow an online exercise class, right? There are so many classes on YouTube or through your gym or somewhere um, where you can follow an, um, an online class. The second thing, second thing you could do is just make it a social activity, right? Whether it's FaceTiming friends or Zoom meetings with friends and then doing an activity together. I had a friend last year really want to get into jazzercise, which seems such an, like an 80s thing, but she made us hop on a Zoom call with us and with her and join a jazzercise class. And Although I wouldn't do it again, it was a fun experience for the one time that I did do it. Um, or then lastly, you could just even dance it out, right? Try a new TikTok dance or just come up with a dance on your own. Super fun, super active, um, and super engaging in a quarantine air era. So some of the benefits of staying active, it heightens your focus, it elevates your mood, lowers your stress levels, it increases your energy, it sharpens your memory, and then lastly, it pre prevents weight gain. You guys already know who I am because I did see familiar face, familiar names from the last few sections. But once again, my name is Amanda Martins. I am a University of Houston Cougar, a current Texas A&M Aggie, um, and I've been at Halbin for about a year and a half. I need to edit that. Sorry. Um, and I'm a second generation Halbin employee. I my dad's been working for the company for 37 years. Two brothers that work in Halliburton. So definitely working for Halliburton and living the Halliburton life runs through my veins. Um, I'm a university recruiting specialist focused on certain schools, but definitely I also focus in more of the STEM recruitment um, aspect for entry level and um, interns for the summer. So let's get kind of straight into today's readiness. You got the offer, now what? Um, it's kind of broken down into different sections. The first section is the components of an offer letter. What should an offer letter really have in it? What is core information that you need to look out for? So this is some basic information, right? Full name and address. That's going to be at the very, very top of your offer letter. 
I would highly, highly, highly encourage you guys to double check, triple check, quadruple check if you have to, that this information, that your first name, your address is correct. Because the minute you sign that offer letter and your, your name is typed in incorrectly, that offer letter actually ends up going to uh, the IT department who ends up creating your email, um, your finance department, if there is like a credit card that the company is issuing you. And if if it is mis misspelt on your offer letter, it's going to be a misspelt email address. And it takes so long for IT to fix that. So just double check that this information is correct before you sign your offer letter. Your offer letter is going to contain position and department as well as location. Double check with your recruiter that this is information that you guys have already talked about before, right? This is not a new position that you've heard about. This is not uh, a new department that you've never, you kn during your interview process, you guys didn't talk about this. Double check that this is correct. Um, it's going to have your location, Double check that this is something that you agreed upon with your recruiter beforehand. Um, anticipated start date, right? Um, if you if you are wanting to start as soon as you graduate, um, let the recruiter know. Maybe they are thinking that you want to take some time off between school and starting work. So they might give you a month leeway. But if you want to start earlier, let them know, say, hey, I don't need to start in June, I can start in May. Or on the other hand, you can say, hey, I'd like to take some time off. Is there a way that I can start in June rather than May? Um, so definitely keep in contact with your recruiter at all times if any of these are an issue. Um, pay, double check that this is what was agreed upon verbally. Um, and double check the pay statements, right? Are you getting paid monthly, semi-monthly? Are you getting paid weekly? They, these are all things to consider. Um, it's going to have benefits information. And usually, you guys, your benefits information on your offer letter is like three three paragraphs. It's not going to have a lot of information. But what your company is going to end up doing is they're going to send you your offer letter with those three paragraphs about your benefits, but they will also send you additional documents going more in depth about your medical 401k, vacation, and sick leave. So if you don't get those documents as an additional PDF, um, always talk to your recruiter, see, say, hey, is there a way you can get some more information about my benefits? Um, because I want to be an informed candidate and I want to make a solid decision. Um, it's going to have your contingencies, and I'll kind of go over the worst contingencies a, comp a company can have, uh, but contingencies just basically mean that if you do not meet XYZ criteria, they have the ability to rescind the offer, so take that offer back. Um, and then the very last things are going to be on your offer letter is HR contact information. So if there are any issues with your offer, if you need to change your full name, if because if there is a typo, that's the person you're going to contact. And very lastly, signature and date so that you can go ahead and get that recruitment process, that onboarding process um, started. So I put together, this is actually an offer letter by Halliburton. Um, I changed all the core information, um, but this is basically worst case scenario offer letter, um, kind of what you would expect to see. So at the very top, usually it'll have your full name and address, position and department next, location estimated start date. You guys, for Halliburton, we've broken this down um, company-wide into different sections off an offer letter, right? Full name is at the very top. Position, department, and location is broken down sentence by sentence. Um, and then you can definitely see benefits and paid time off is also broken down into subsections. But some companies do it a little differently. Some companies might put all of this in, in you know, a, a paragraph format with no subsections. So my best advice to you guys, and this is something that my dad told me when I was entering the workforce and got my first offer letter, was to take a highlight. It was to print out first an offer letter, have a physical copy of it, um, and take a physical highlighter and highlight these important details. So 
this, this basic information, highlight all this information so that you are aware you, this is information that sticks out because this is important information. If you don't have access to a printer and you can't print it out, what you can do is just you know, highlight these things on your computer. So your PDF, you should, have a, you should have a way to highlight documents. Always highlight this important information because, you know, months down the line, if you need to go back and double check your offer letter, if something happens, you can do so. And that information that you need will pop out. Um, it'll be super obvious. You won't have to like search for it. So the next part, apart from location and estimated start date, is going to have that pay salary as well as the pay frequency and then your benefits, medical, retirement planning, vacation, and sick leave. Like I said, in Halliburton, we've broken it down into small subsections. Most companies break it down to three or four paragraphs. But, and they will send additional documents, additional PDF files with way more information about your benefits, medical 401k. They just can't put this in the official offer letter because like I said, the, your benefits and med medical and 401k, that's a lot of information that would just overload your offer letter, okay? That second page of your offer letter is going to be your contingencies. Like I said, if you don't meet these contingencies, the company has the ability to rescind or take back that offer letter. So I put together actually five of the worst contingencies that Halliburton has to have. Um, usually these are common five. It depends on your, your rank, what position you're entering, whether it's an entry level or for more of a senior position. It definitely depends on, on the company and the position, like I said, but always, always double check your contingencies. All right. So the first contingency is your eligibility to work. This is just, this is just the, you know, when companies ask, will you now or in the future require sponsorship? This is just double checking that information. Um, if the company doesn't sponsor international students and you, you are an international student, you don't have eligibility to work in the U.S. under their criteria, right? Um, so they can rescind the offer for that. Um, there, there are small things here and there. So just double check that all this information is accurate and your recruiter is aware of your eligibility to work status. The second contingency that most companies have is a pre-employment alcohol or drug screening. So this is your usual, you know, pee in a cup test. Um, but usually companies can do a pee in a cup or they can do a follicle testing where they pull strands of your hair um, and test your hair. They could even do a blood test. And usually you guys follicle testing, um, things that you ingest stay in your follicle a lot longer than a urine or a blood test. So I always tell students, just be aware of that um, and don't do what you're not supposed to do. Uh, number three, intellectual property, property confidentiality, and post-employment restrictions agreement. This is really broken down into... Um, two, three things. The first one is an intellectual property. This is basically just saying that if you are to create any invention and product uh, on behalf of the company, you don't own the product. The company ends up owning the product. Yes, you will be accredited as an inventor or as the, the thought process behind it, but you won't own the actual invention or project. And the reason because of, the reason companies do that is because if you end up leaving, right? If you end up leaving the company, you could potentially leave with that project or that invention and take it to a competitor. And then your past employer is no longer um, the leader in that field or industry. So when they have an IP agreement, they own the invention. You can't take it to a competitor. Um, and even though for forever you will be you will be assigned as the inventor, the creator, um, so on and so forth. It's just to protect their own rights um, and their own status in in their field or in their industry. 
The second part to that is the confidentiality agreement. Um, this is usually more for like companies that are doing a lot of tech stuff. So like R and D work, um, basically this is just saying that any work that is confidential, don't spread it around. <laughs> don't tell people, don't kill competitors, um, because they do have the ability to take you to court if you end up spreading, um, you know, their inventions or their projects or ideas behind what makes whatever company great. The third part of that post-employment restrictions agreement kind of ties into the fifth one. Um, and, I'll, and I'll go over that in a little bit. So I won't get into that right now. The fourth contingency is a successful completion of a comprehensive background uh, investigation. This is just your regular background check, right? Just confirming that whatever you've done in your own um, personal life has not... Um, it does will not affect the company. Um, a lot of times companies will will not allow employees or not accept employees that have a violent past. Um, but I always tell students, um, if you have something on your background that you think is going to pop up, um, always tell your recruiter so that they are aware of it. A lot of times employers, if you talk to them and explain the situation a little bit, they're willing to overlook it and they're willing to kind of pass it along and don't, don't stress out too much about it. If, if something pops up and you didn't tell your recruiter about it and you don't want to kind of explain about it, they are more than likely going to say no and just move on and not give you that offer. Um, I always tell students, you, there are so many things that can happen, right? You could be wrong time, wrong place. It could be a minor offense. Um, I've had students explain situations to me and I'm like, oh, that doesn't look as bad as what's on your record. That's totally okay. Don't worry about it. We'll pass it over. Um, but like I said, that the communication, that honesty between you and that recruiter is so vital to, to getting you um, onboarded and with that team um, full time. That fifth contingency is a no fixed duration. This kind of ties into a post-employment restrictions agreement, um, but a, a no fixed duration basically means that um, in, in certain states in the United States, you can, you can quit the company for any reason. You don't have to give them two weeks notice. That is just professional courtesy. But on the other hand, that also means that the company can lay you off or fire you with, with, no, with no notice. Um, they, they're not required to give you warnings or to give you um, any notice about your termination. Um, that is what a no fixed duration is. And it applies in certain states and it doesn't apply in some states states. Um, you just have to be very careful about it. In the state of Texas, we are a no fixed duration state. Um, so just be aware of that. The post-employment restrictions agreement that ties into this no fixed duration. Basically what that means is if you end up um, leaving the company for any reason, um, you you are not allowed to work for a certain competitor for a certain amount of time. Okay. Um, the certain amount of time could be three weeks. It could be 18 months. It could be two years. It could be seven years. It could be 10 years. It, the, the level, the time increases as you go on into the company, as your level of seniority within the company increases. And I always tell students, if you get a contingency that has a post-employment restrictions agreement is to ask your recruiter, hey, can I get a list of, of companies that you guys consider competitors? And the reason I say this is because Halliburton, we're an oil and gas service company. So our competitors are not other oil and gas companies, right? Our competitors are not Shell and Chevron. Our competitors are other service companies. So um, if you guys are aware of like Schlumberger or Baker Hughes, which are all service companies, they are what we consider competitors. So 
being being aware of who your company considers competitors when you are deciding to leave the company is so 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 important because what you don't want to happen is you end up joining a competitor and your past employer ends up suing you um, because you agree to this post-employment restrictions agreement and a lot of times your new company will take on that court case and you won't have to worry about it but on the other side, what could happen is your new company can say, hey, I didn't know you signed a post-employment restrictions agreement. Um, this is your headache to solve. So you are the one that is slapped up with lawyers fees, with court uh, court dates and court appointments. So just be very aware if you have a post-employment restrictions agreement. Like I said, you might have it, you might not have it. Um, Contingencies just really, really depend on the person, the position, and the company. Um, that last, very last page of the offer letter, like I said, is going to have that HR contact information. So if there are any issues with your offer letter, this is the person you're going to contact, that Jane Driller, that HR representative. And then it's going to have your offer deadline when you need to have a yes or a no buy, and then signature and date. So I talked about no fixed duration. You can also see the same no fixed duration as at will employment. They mean the exact same thing. And like I said, an employer can lay, can terminate your um in, your your work um, at any time for any reason, as long as it's not an illegal one, like about your race, about your gender, um, about your disability, about sexual orientation, all that all that good jazz under Title IX. But on the other hand, it also means that an employee can can quit without giving two weeks notice. Two weeks notice is just a professional court courtesy in the state of Texas. So I listed below the states that have um, at-will employment laws. Texas does fall under um, at-will employment, but maybe uh, you know states like California does not. So maybe you want to take your employment to California. It just really depends on you and kind of what you're looking for and what you have available or what offers are given to you, right? Um. Okay, moving on from that, this I, I kind of want to talk a little bit more in depth about vacation slash sick leave um, and combined vacation and sick leave. So at some companies, they could be very separate, right? You could have a clause in your off letter that says, this is your vacation time, you get two weeks, and you get a week of sick leave. A lot of times companies can do combined vacation and sick leave, but they will call it paid time off or PTO. Um, when it is combined, it means that if you are on vacation and you get sick that next week, that all counts for your two weeks off for the whole year, right? So I always tell students, if you have combined vacation slash sick leave, that's, that's okay. Don't stress out about it. It's not a bad thing. Uh, but you have to be aware that if you take up all your vacation time in January, and then in December, you are down with the flu and you have to be off work, um, what happens is companies are going to be like, oh, well, let's look at their paid time off balance to see how much time they can take off because they're sick. Well, they can see also that you've taken all your vacation time in January. So there's no PTO hours left over. So they're going to say, okay, this is what's what we're going to do. We're going to calculate how much you make a day. And we're going to take that out of your paycheck because you're not working because you're sick and you used up all your sick time or PTO before before you knew you were sick. So I always tell students when you have combined PTO, just be aware not to use up all your vacation at the start of the year because you never know what can happen if you could become sick or you just don't feel like coming to work one day because you're feeling kind of drab and down. Um, just be aware that companies have the ability to calculate how much you make per day and take that out of your paycheck. Um, some companies also give you the option to purchase vacation. Um, basically, it's the same thing as what I talked about before. If you're sick, you don't have vacation time, 
companies will calculate how much you make a day and they will allow you to buy those hours. Um, and you can either pay it up front or what you can do is you can say, hey, I want to buy a day of vacation and it costs, let's say, $10. Okay, well, that $10 can come out of all your paychecks for the whole year. So it could be, you know, a couple dollars every paycheck, um, or it can come out all in the very first paycheck. It just really depends on you and what you feel comfortable with. And that hourly pay is that the day pay rate, it changes person to person, basically, whatever your salary is, um, they'll calculate that. Um, it's not something that I can kind of tell you, oh, it, it's definitely $10 that comes out of your paycheck if you want to buy vacation time. Um, not how it works. <clears throat> Sorry. So let's look what to look out for just a continuation. Um, think about vesting periods. So this can happen in retirement plans or stock options. Um, but basically what this means is that companies will match to a certain percentage, right? Um, for your individual, individual contribution. So say you are going to, um, you're going to invest 3% of your paycheck into your retirement plan, okay? Um, companies will decide, hey, I'm also going to invest 3% into your retirement plan. Um, this is money that the company itself owns. I'm, uh, I'm going to give you that money to put in and total com combination, your 3% plus the company's 3% is 6% um, of your salary goes into your retirement plan. Well, companies can also add vesting periods, which means that, hey, I will give you that 3% from the company if you stay with the company for um, at least 180 days, okay? And that number is made up. Whatever the company says that number is, that's what the number is. You can't you can negotiate that, that number. It could be three years. It can be 180 days. It can be 30 days. It can be five years, seven years. It just really depends. Um, but let's say 180 days. So once you, the company will put in that 3% of money, and after 180 days, so on that 181st day, they can say, okay, this 3% is yours so that if you end up leaving the company after those 180 days, you can take the money that you put into the, your retirement plan, so your 3% plus the 3% that I put in. What happens is if you leave on day 179, right, you, if you end up quitting day 179, they're, they're going to say, okay, if you're going to leave the company, you can leave with your 3% that you put into your retirement plan, but I'm not going to give you that 3% as a company. That is my money. You should have stayed for 180 days. Then you could have gotten my 3%. So a lot of times you'll see people say, hey, I'm actually going to leave right after the vesting period. I've put in too much time at this company not to get an extra 3% uh, for my retirement plan. Um, and some people will say, you know what? It's not worth it. I don't want to stay at this company any longer. I'm going to head out and leave. Um, and so they'll leave without that, that company vesting money. Um, so just be aware of what your vesting period is, how long the day is, and then you have to do a personal reflection and see, hey, do I really want to stick with this company for another year until my vesting period comes up or um, should I just leave right now? It just really depends on you and your own personal relationship with your retirement plan, okay? Uh, a non-compete. I talked about this. This is that post-employment restrictions agreement, but that wording can be the same as a non-compete. Like I said, double check with your recruiter who the list of competitors are, because the list of competitors that you think might be competitors might be very different from the list of competitors the actual company thinks are competitors. All right. 
So there are some things to consider um, when you are joining the the company full time. Think about the facility, right? Um, this is something that I definitely didn't consider after after joining my first job. Um, when I when I started, my my office was um, in a the parking space in the parking idea of this space was just a parking lot, right? Well, in Texas, it gets really hot, right? It gets up to 100 degrees, sometimes even hotter. And I would get into my car and my car would be so terribly hot. And it would have problems with my, I would end up having problems with my engine. And I ended up talking to my mechanic and he was like, yeah, it's because your car is under direct sunlight for eight plus hours in a day, right? So I one of the things that I always consider when joining a company is, hey, do you guys have a parking garage where it's covered or is it a parking lot? This is something that matters to me, but it doesn't matter to a lot of people. Think about that. Um, a lot of things to consider as well as gyms, right? If you are like a gym rat or if you just like going to the gym and it's really important to you, does the facility, does the company have a gym on campus or is there a gym nearby that you can get to? Something personally that I dealt with was when I joined that very first company, the closest gym was like 30 miles away. Um, and I didn't really think of that impact when I joined the company. Um, and and that, that, was, that was something that was a big, big no-no for me. So when I joined Halliburton, that was one of the things that I considered. Is there a gym on campus? If you are somebody that doesn't like cooking and you want to get your meals in the cafeteria, are there healthy options? Is the food good? Um, these are all things to consider within the facility. So think about that. All right. And there are lots of other things, but these are the top three things that I can think of off the top of my head um, right now. In terms of team, I always tell students, once you've got an offer letter, right? Once you've gotten, whether it's a physical offer letter or a verbal offer, ask the manager if you can speak to somebody on the team. Now, this doesn't have to be an interview. This can be a coffee chat. This can be um, you know, a 15-minute Zoom conversation because the people that you spend the people that you spend your time with on your professional team are people that you spend more time with than your own family, okay? Because you spend eight hours a day, five days a week with them. They have to be people that you can generally get along with. Um, and so I always tell students, ask your manager if you can schedule coffee dates or a coffee chat or a Zoom chat with your with someone from the team because they can give you an idea if the team, um, you know, welcomes newbies, if they're if they're nice, if they are very shy, if everyone's very individual. If they all work on a team, this gives you great insights into how your career will progress within the team. Think about travel. Um, is the company requiring you to travel a lot? And if so, are they willing to pay for that travel up front? Or are you going to have to pay for that travel and then get reimbursed, right? Travel is not cheap. Um, the company might say, hey, why don't you pay for it and then we'll, we'll reimburse you. Well, how long is the reimbursement policy, right? Is it, it, does it take 30 days for me to get my money back or does it take six months to get my money back? Because that's a lot of money if you travel a lot. So think about that. Um, these are all small things to consider but would make a huge impact on you once you start working. So if you're going to accept an offer, is negotiation really the right decision? Well, there are several things to think about. Think about relocation. Are you having to move away from San Angelo? Um, if they are requiring you to move to Houston, um, are they going to pay for your flight to move? Are they going to pay for your, um, you know, maybe if you're not going to fly, your mileage, if you're going to bring your car, it's a lot of miles to drive. Are they going to pay for that? Are they going to pay for maybe a hotel room until you get an apartment? Or maybe are they going to pay for you to break your lease? If you have an apartment, a year's lease in San Angelo, and you're wanting to, they're wanting you to move to Houston before your lease is up. Think about that. This is, this is money that companies can give you. Um, and usually there's no repayment 
payment clause on a relocation stipend. On the other hand, a company might give you a sign on bonus. So this is a lump sum of money. As soon as you sign your offer letter, it gets dropped into your, into your bank account. Um, and usually sign on bonuses come with a repayment clause. So what is a repayment clause? Basically, that means that if you don't work for the company for a certain amount of days, the, these days depend on, on the company. It'll be very clearly stated in your sign on bonus. If you end up leaving the company beforehand, they're going to say, hey, you left the company beforehand and we gave you, let's say, $2,000. You got to pay the, you got to pay the money up front right now. Um, I need that money. They're going to make you, def- they're going to make you repay that sign on bonus. So I always tell students, hey, if you are planning on leaving the company that gave you a sign-on bonus, a couple of things to consider. are: Do you have enough of money right now in your bank account to pay out that sign-on bonus? Um, is it going to take a huge dent in your bank account? Is that something to consider? Or should you just stick out your time with the company until your sign-on bonus period ends? And then you can leave the company. And usually your sign-on bonus, you guys... It's not like three years or 10 years. It's more than likely 12 months or 18 months. Uh, But usually I've not seen sign-on bonus periods longer than 18 months. Think about the cost of living, right? Think about the cost of um, of city and the food, the the cars, the gas, the, um, your apartment, day-to-day activities, metro fees, bus passes. Think about all of this because there have been times where students will tell me, Hey, Amanda, I got an offer from a company and they had, they gave me two grand more and the company is based in California. And I'm like, okay, it's two grand more, but the company is based in California. The cost of living in California is much higher than the cost of living in Texas. So when you consider the cost of living in general in California, that $2,000 doesn't seem like $2,000 extra that's going into your bank account. It actually gets, gets tied in very quickly into that cost of living. So thinking about that, don't just go for the offer with the highest money. Think about all these things. Um, You can negotiate if you have industry or job function experience, right? So you you can negotiate your salary or vacation time. And I will say internships do count as industry industry experience or job function experience. When I joined Halliburton, I didn't have any oil and gas service experience. I didn't have any oil and gas experience, but I did have HR experience. And that was something that I was able to negotiate. That's what I mean by job function. So think about that. So if you are going to negotiate a couple things, the first thing you're going to need to know is your worth, right? What extra value are you bringing to the company? What extra skills? Is there certain equipment that the team doesn't know that you are a pro in and that's why they're bringing you on? Um, is there a relationship with a certain co- another company or a vendor or, or something or the other that you're bringing in um, that adds to your value? Think about all of that. Um, I always tell students, think about the exact number. When I ask students, well, what are you looking for in terms of salary? They always end up telling me, oh, man, I'm looking for a salary between 60 to 65. Well, if you, if you said that you're going to accept 60, why am I going to give you an offer for 65, right? So I always tell students a more precise number is always the best choice. So if you are wanting to go, you know, 65,000, um, I always tell students to go maybe 64,750 or 65,250. Um, being specific with that number is super, super important. Don't mention any personal reasons for wanting a higher salary. Make sure you are factual and precise. Companies are machines, right? They don't look at the emotion side of it. They kind of really don't care if you have 
poor kids or a mortgage or if you have three dogs or you know you have you have personal things going on they are paying you to do a job um, regardless of the extra situations that your life is currently in so if you're wanting a higher salary give them facts for wanting that higher salary those skills those ex that extra value that you're going to be bringing in um, make sure you're emailing the recruiter. Your recruiter is part of HR. They know the capital, the budget that the department can spend on the on the candidate, on you. Um, so the HR person is the best person to contact when negotiating. And lastly, don't fear the no, right? The worst thing that a manager can tell you is no. Um, the the best thing that they can that can happen is they say absolutely let's take that that money that you were saying that exact number and let's work with it or they might say maybe right they might say hey 64 750 doesn't really work with us but how about 6400 and that's still way better than where you started with your negotiation right so really really don't for, don't fear the no that's literally the worst thing that can happen um, I will say that if you are negotiating past the first stage, right, so you're getting into the nitty gritty details of negotiation, be mindful that the company expects you to accept the offer. Um, if you are negotiation, negotiating in that first step and you're like, you know what, 64, 750, even though they agreed with it, doesn't really fit me, that's fine. Um, I'm not going to go with them. That's totally okay, you guys. Let them know and you move on. But if you are saying, oh, the company comes back with 64, 750, and they're like, well, how about 64, 800? How about 64, 850? And you keep going, you keep negotiating, getting down to that second and third stage, they're expecting you to say yes. So how do you ask? So usually I always tell students, do not negotiate over the phone because there is no written documentation of that negotiation. Always put together emails. Emails have written communication. This is something you can always backtrack towards. If there are any issues going forward in your onboarding process, you can come back to this, this email, this, this written documentation. So in your email, the main goal is to be kind because you appreciate that they gave you their offer, but you're going to be firm because you know your worth. So I'm going to use Leah because Leah is my current manager. I'm going to say, hey, Leah, thank you for taking the time to review the offer with me. I'm excited the prospect of joining your team, but I do have concerns about the salary. I've done my market research for R&D engineers in the industry and in the Houston, Texas region, and I found that the average salary is 60K a year. So I've done my market research, right? Not just engineers, but R&D engineers, not just United States, but Houston, Texas region. Um, and that's very specific numbers, $60,000 $60, a year. I'm going to then move on to kind of the reasoning behind it, right? The current offer is a little bit below that. I know that I will be a great asset and be able to contribute quickly, not to to not only the project, but to the team because of my prior internship and co-op experiences that have heavily utilized my skills in MS Visual Studio. So I'm highlighting my prior experience and my skills. This is my extra value, right? Knowing what you're worth, this is what, what I'm bringing into the company. I was hoping to discuss a starting salary of 62750 very, very specific, to, be, to keep in line with the average and the cost of living in Houston. Um, this is factual, not based on emotion, right? I'm not saying, oh, it's because I have two dogs that I have a husband at home that I'm wanting 62750 No, I'm saying um, it's because I'm looking at the average cost of living um, in Houston and the general salary that R&D engineers make in Houston, Texas. Okay, so that is acceptance. If you're going to decline, that is A-okay. Don't stress out about it. Um, it's totally okay to decline if the company isn't a right fit, if the team, culture, management, career path, role, if none of these are a right fit for you, because this is the start of your career, which is so pivotal, it's okay to decline an offer. Um, do not feel bad. They are going to move on to another candidate. 
Um, usually sometimes that candidate is somebody that you know. Um, and that, that is a friend that's like, Hey man, I have been interviewing everywhere and I still haven't received an offer. Well, maybe they were number two in line to receive that offer. So the faster that you decline, the faster that they can move on to that next candidate that is really wanting that job. So if you have, it's, it's, also totally okay to decline an offer if you have multiple offers okay so if you have like five offers and you know the bottom three offers were really really low in terms of salary you can say hey i'm not going to even negotiate with them that offer is so dang low i'm going to just move on okay you can just let them go no big deal and let them know hey i'm declining because your offer wasn't your money wasn't high enough or i'm entertaining other offers or i just wasn't excited about the experience and the project that you had described during the interviewing process that's totally fine so when you're dealing with multiple offers a couple things to consider think about the bonus structure that companies have right is if a company has bonuses are they going to pay them um are they going to pay them quarterly are they gonna is it performance based is it um is, is a yearly bonus. It just really, really depends. Um, and I would always double check on that structure. Think about the work-life balance. This is when talking to that teammate is comes in so handy. You can talk to your teammate and say, hey, do you have a proper work-life balance? Does your manager or our potential manager accept our boundaries when it comes to your professional work environment? So think about that. Um, think about the commute to work. When I got my first job, I got it out in the middle of nowhere, but I told myself, hey, I want to stay in central Houston because it is closest to my friends and it's closest to the bars in downtown Houston. Well, I go to the bars, well, before COVID, I used to go to the bars in downtown Houston like maybe once a week, once a fortnight, but I would go to work five days a week, right? So was it really worth 40 minutes in traffic um, back and forth if I'm only five minutes away from the bar? Not really, that because time and traffic will take years of your life, I promise down the line to so think about that. Think about the career path. Talk to your teammate again. Ask them, hey, um, what is what is becoming from an engineer one to an engineer three take? Does our manager encourage us to take trainings and join other projects? Um, these are all things to consider. Think about wellness workers. I talked about gyms, but think about, uh, you know, does your company have a fitness group? If that's something that's important to you or a book club or a mental health resource, uh, do they have a, a therapist on hand, so on and so forth. Think about all of these things. Um, think about employee resource groups. So I always tell students at your university, right at ASU, you might be part of the greater ASU, you know, network, but you're also part of maybe a sorority or a fraternity or a social engagement group or a major specific org or, you know, something or the other. So you're part of a smaller community within the ASU community. Same thing when you grow up and you start working. You could be part of the Halliburton family, but you can also be part of a smaller um Hanneth, a uh, Halliburton African American Networks Forum, or you could be part of Pride for our LGBTQIA plus group. It, there are so many smaller orgs within the company that can help you really fine tune yourself and it can help you grow your professional development and grow your own personal network. Um, so think about this. It's super important to kind of get into it. I One of the selling things for me for Halliburton is we have WISE, which is um, a women sharing excellence org. And we have women from different departments that talk about ways to better improve ourselves, ways to stand out in oil and gas. And I really enjoyed learning more about it and joining it. Um, and that was super important for me when I was joining a company. So think about this. This could have an impact on your life going forward. 
So some of the consequences of reneging and ghosting, you guys, we are almost done. Another couple of slides and then we are all good for today. So some of the consequences of reneging, right? Reneging is just going back on a promise. Say a person has made you, a recruiter has made you a verbal offer and you're like, absolutely. Yes. I'm so excited. I can't wait to join. And then you're like, actually, no, I'm not going to join. Or they give you a physical written offer and then you're like, yes, I signed the offer. I'm done. And then you end up calling them and saying, hey, I'm actually not going to join you for the summer. That is reneging. Ghosting, you might see it in your personal love lives, but it also happens in your professional lives. It happens when a, when a candidate, we've been in contact for this whole time. I've given them an offer, but then all of a sudden they stop answering my emails. They stop answering our calls. It, it's it's not the most professional way of telling a recruiter, hey, I'm not interested. There are consequences of reneging and ghosting, you guys. One of the first consequences is that the recruiter and manager are going to be upset, okay? They are going to say, dang, why did we waste all this time interviewing, negotiating with you if you're just going to ghost us, right? It doesn't put you in the best light for either, either recruiter or manager. The second thing is that any future opportunity of the company is compromised. That's not saying you are not going to get a, a job, another job of the company going forward. But there is going to be a mark in your file saying, hey, this candidate was given an offer, but then ended up ghosting us. Or, hey, this candidate accepted an offer, but then ended up saying, no, I'm not interested. Um, and they might say, hey, down the line, Hey, we gave you an offer before and you didn't, you reneged on it. Are you actually serious about joining us this time? They might second guess your, um, your desire to join the company. And this could be an opportunity that you really, really want to get into. So think about that. The last thing, the co last consequence of reneging or ghosting is that honestly that it's a small world in university recruiting or recruiting in general. Um, you never know who your recruiters know. Um, you never know if they're friends with each other. I'll tell you there is a conference for university recruiters that we all end up going to, whether it's virtual or in person. We all talk. Um, personally, I had, I had, hired uh, an intern one summer and they ended up not showing up to work one week and I was worried as a human being because I'm like what's wrong with this kid is he um is he sick is he at home did he get into an accident is he okay um I ended up calling the university because he was dodging my calls dodging my emails the university said he was fine and I moved on about it and I made a mark in his file turned around, joined Halliburton, and guess who I saw in the cafeteria that second day of my job? The same candidate. I went to my boss. We made a note about it on his file so that if he ends up not showing up to work, we know that he ghosted us again at this new company. So it does, it, it's a small world. It happens. Just be very aware of it, okay? So if you're going to decline, that is A-OK, -okay, like I said, but how do you really write that email? Because you're going you're gonna to want to do it over email. The first thing that you're going to do is thank them for the consideration, right? They gave you an offer. They, they were excited about you. You were excited at the potential opportunity. Thank them for giving you this, this offer. You're going to state why you're declining. Be honest with them. Tell them, are you declining because you've got an offer with better money? Are you declining because you got an offer that meets your career goals, your career path for the future? That's totally okay, but be honest with them. Because if it, if it is salary, maybe it's something that the company needs to review, right? So that they are not lowballing other candidates. Um, thank them for, thank the managers for their time and effort for interviewing your manager, especially if you're not in HR and recruiting. Your manager has another job, a job that they're getting paid to do. On top of that, they are interviewing candidates and negotiating with them. So just be aware of that. Thank them for their time and their effort to do so. Um, let them know you want to maintain a relationship. You never know what can happen if you end up wanting to join their team 10 years down the line, as long as you have that relationship open um, and it's a positive relationship, that's totally okay. 
And then lastly, wish them the best and end with your signature. So this is a mock decline email. I'm going to use Leah again. So I said, dear Leah, thank you so much for considering me for the position. While I do agree that I'd be a great fit for the team, I don't feel like the role itself is right for me at this time. As we discussed earlier, I'm currently weighing all my options and have decided to take another opportunity. I would like to thank Mr. Bob and Ms. Jill for allowing me to glimpse into projects and programs that would have enhanced my career goals. And I hope to maintain this relationship so that if anything in the future changes, we can reconnect. All the best and I wish you luck in your candidate search. Very simple, very easy. This ends the relationship for now. It can always be opened up again down the line. All right. This is all that I have for you guys today. That's all I have. This is the last section of readiness that I will give to you guys this semester. So I appreciate you guys um, joining in, tuning in today, especially thank you if you have put up with me for all four sections of readiness. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this course um, and it will help you in the future. If you guys have any questions, doubts, if you need some help reviewing resumes or doing a mock interview, I am happy to do so. Shoot me an email at that general email. So that's resource.hou.f H-O-U u-n-i-v at halliburton.com i know it's a little bit long and tedious but i will leave it on the computer screen for a little bit longer and i'll pop it in the chat as well um, but if you have any questions i'm happy to take them if not you guys are good uh you guys are good to go with the rest of your day i appreciate you guys stopping in Thank you, Amanda, for coming. We certainly appreciate it. Um, guys, if you have any questions for Amanda that you think of later, let us know at Career Development and we can help connect the two of y'all. So Amanda, thank you for an hour of your time this evening and we'll give, your, give you your evening back as well. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye.